Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So good to be together and to see young people stepping up to, uh, to go to the other side of the world and love people in Jesus' name. Nothing more exciting than that. Well, if you have a Bible, why don't you go to Luke 5. We're going to look uh, again in week three in our series called Love My Neighbor. Luke 5, we're going to look at a very, very um, familiar encounter in Jesus' life and try to figure out what that means for us. As we do that, though, uh, today we want to talk about the power of food. Food has power, right? It does. Uh, and if you don't believe that, just stay and, and eat at the end. You realize this one little animal gets so tasty when, when a, a friend of ours, Kurt, uh, puts his hands on this little thing that's now going to feed us. All right, uh, Kurt, prep still, where are you? We're going to invite Kurt to come up. All right, come up this side. And I want you to welcome Kurt to the stage. <laughs> welcome, welcome. And so all throughout this series, we're, we're trying to connect with real life people in our church that are doing the things that we're going to read about in Scripture. Kurt, you are, um, you are Brisket Boy BBQ. Yes. Okay, give us a little bit. Of, for those of you who have been a part of our first Sunday, you've been doing this for years. What is brisket? How did you get the brisket boy thing? Brisket boy? Because you don't look like a boy. Yeah. I'm saying. Well, I was a boy. I'm okay. not the size of many boys. Um, okay, yes. But who trusts Children. a skinny cook? Anybody? No. So, <laughs> truth, it hurts so much. Um, Year, years, I grew up with a dad who liked to barbecue. He was always grilling, like there's always burgers and chicken and stuff. And uh, I always liked to do it too. And then when I was like in my 20s, I bought my first smoker and I liked doing it a lot. And That's like, for, for food. Food, yes. Clarifying. For food. Just, just, I'm Oregon, Washington, yeah, right. California. So. I might not have a filter, but I'm a good kid. Okay, okay. yes. But, um, and then I bought my first real smoker smoker, like a Traeger, years and years ago when they first came out. And I started playing around with it a lot. And I was always like going to my brother, like bringing food over. And my big brother used to just be like, brisket boy, when I'd show up with brisket. Yes. And uh, my I'm wife. Th I think I'm going to wake up tomorrow saying that. Yep. Brisket and, uh, boy. Brisket boy. Uh, yeah. And my uh, wife said, if you ever have a business, you should name it brisket boy. Okay. And then after time, people started saying, hey, I'm having a party. Can you make food for my party? Can you God. do this? Can you do that? And it just... It just took off, and now I do stuff like about 30-plus events every year. This is on top of family and regular work and all that. Yeah, this on top is... of job, job, and work, and yeah. coaching, and wow. life. So yeah. you, you love it, and God's opened a door, obviously. Yeah. And so you're also part of our, one of our 26 West communities. How does food like play into what you do when you gather? Do you guys eat at every, all? Ev every Every time. single time. Okay. Um, we, I always make some kind of meat. Yeah. Um, for it, so like brisket or pulled pork or whatever, um, but it's potluck style. We always have a really good meal. Yeah, um, and it's just that it's the center of what we do is yeah. a good meal, and I'm a firm believer that if you have good food, nothing but good's going to come from it. Yeah, I, I got a feeling. I got a feeling your group may quadruple because <laughs> I'm joining. Right. Uh, so you, you do food when you meet. That's a beautiful thing. Well, give us a little bit because somehow God uses your natural like love to connect people. Just give us one example because you have tons. One example where food and what you're doing made a difference beyond just the meal, beyond, beyond what they ate. A couple summers ago, doing a party for somebody in my community in the neighborhood, um, and this, for this man, and his, uh, it was his birthday, and he was estranged from his adult son, just like no relationship whatsoever. And his son actually showed up to drop off a present to his, for his dad, for his yeah. birthday. And I was there early and was slicing brisket at the time and getting stuff, and he actually stopped and was like, started talking barbecue with me. And so I'm sitting there talking with the guy, and he really liked barbecue, and so he's picking my brain, and I'm talking with him a lot, and then yeah. out comes his dad. Yeah. And then it's just the three of us, and he didn't yeah. leave. Wow. And so it was the three of us talking, and it just didn't end. Yeah. And people started showing up for the party, and his son didn't leave. And he stayed and talked and hung out with his dad the whole time. And ever yeah. since then, they've been connected since then. Wow. And it's, just, wow. it's been awesome. 
Wow, so, wow. All right, this message is done. Let's have communion. Let's eat. Yep. Yep, about 250 pounds of pulled pork back there. Let's get her down. Yeah, and, and, and since you're here, like, the, the wood has something to do with it into the thing, right? Yeah. And so... Yes, you like the wood. We're speaking technical lingo. Today's, t- today's wood that, that smoked it was, was what? It's uh, oak, bur- oak. It's oak bourbon barrels, so it's charred. Right. It's used oak bourbon barrels. And then it just goes in. And you burn it, and it's, yes, and yes. the smoke goes. And, yes, and, the smoke yes. does the thing. And yes. I get here early because as a shepherd of the sheep, I just wanted to taste it first to make sure it's yes. legit. So I, He's the best quality control man I in the have, business. I've been there. The best. I humble myself before the best. you. Okay, thank you, Kurt, for sharing a little bit thank you. about what you're doing. Thanks, man. You can just take that down and get it, okay. get it to him. Thank yeah, you. thank you. You know, the Bible is alive because when we read the Bible, we ought to see ourselves right in the text. And so what we want to look today is to kind of round out. Kurt's had this unique experience of being able to transform something as simple as food into not just joy and laughter and he, you know, caters all sorts of events, but it's been a vehicle for something bigger. That's why, uh, friends, we make the sacrifice everyone once a month to meet together. We do this every month, 12 months of the year, the first Sunday, because we believe something happens when we're together. Healthy families eat together. Healthy families spend time for one another. And so meals are always about more than what's being served. It's more about filling your stomach. Food is a vehicle to something greater. And you do see that in Luke 5. So why don't we just turn there. Verse 27 is where we want to begin. Again, this is a repeated story about Jesus. This isn't the only time this happens, but it's the one I want to center on because Luke gives this interesting twist that is subtle, and I'll get to it at the end. It's really, really subtle, but he's going to guide us to where we want to go this morning. After this, verse 27 Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and he left everything and he followed him. And then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Uh, My wife and I, we got back a little while ago from our 25th anniversary in Italy. And we went to a bunch of towns, and yes, all of the food was great in all of the towns. I don't care, expensive or inexpensive, It was just delicious. But the same thing happened everywhere we went, everywhere. We'd show up, you know, use an app, find a spot, we'd show up and say, oh, welcome. Do you have a reservation? Now, mind you, I'm looking out, right? And two of the 30 tables are filled. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Do you have a reservation? I'm I'm sorry, I don't. Oh. And they, they go back and I'm thinking, open your eyes. Nobody's here. But so they would say, oh, okay. And they would find a table for us of the 28 that are available. But here's what would happen. By the time we had our appetizer, the place is packed and nobody leaves. Every meal was an invitation to spend the entire evening together. You see, in most of Europe, and I, I knew this, but it really, it really was heightened. In, in most places in Europe, when you go out to eat, it is not about the food alone. It is about the experience. So when you say, let's go out to eat, what you mean is let's spend the entire evening together. So when you go to a restaurant, you need to know this, you are booking it for the night. There is no one who's going to push you out. It is absolutely yours for the taking. So thus, I should have had a reservation because everyone is going to spend the evening. So you have a little appetizer and you have your little first and then you have your little second and then you have your little espresso and then you have your little dessert. Then you have your little limoncello. That's another story for another day. And then and you eventually, eventually leave. Now for us in the U.S., this seems foreign because food has become about efficiency. And we've replaced rooms with drive-thrus, no offense, Brian, and we've, we've 
we've made it all about, if you're a restaurant manager, it's all about turnover, turning the tables over to get as much cash from as much people in a given night. And I'm all for business and I'm all for productivity, but I think that in that it's a sign of where our heart and minds have drifted. We've drifted away from intentionally spending loads of time with people and replaced it with making it just part of nutrition for the day and gone. So as a culture, I'm stereotyping, but I, I would say we've lost the joy of what it means to gather around a meal. Not everyone, not all the time, but as a culture, we're losing that joy. So what we want to do in the series is recapture things that are important to Jesus. That's what we want to do. And whether you feel like long meals is a comfortable thing for you or not, or if you have time for it or not, I have to wonder if this is a key value in the life of Jesus. And as his disciples, if we're called to step in to things that Jesus values. So, so what was eating a meal uh, like in Jesus' time? This is where culture is really important. Meals in Jesus' day were about much more than food. Uh, a quote from one scholar, Scott uh, Barchi, he writes this, being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become, thinking of the first century, had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Thus betrayal or unfaithfulness towards anyone with whom you had shared the table was viewed this is an interesting phrase, as particularly reprehensible. He's got a PhD, so he has to make it hard. <laughs> if you eat with someone, you don't stab them in the back. If you invited someone to your table, you've welcomed them in. He ends the quote with this. On the other hand, when, a per when persons were estranged, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation. Just think of the Kurt story about this, this party became a vehicle for a father and a son to reconnect. So why are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that are with the Pharisees, why are they complaining? This is where, again, a little bit of background is helpful. The Pharisees took the Bible literally and seriously. And so when you went to temple to worship, there were all sorts of cleansings that you went to because to go to God's space, to be with God is important. So I want to prepare my body and my heart to be with God. And if you go to the temple, you realize that the priests and the Levites, they washed everything and they handled everything with particular care. Is God a germaphobe? No. Is God OCD? No. Well, maybe. But no, he's not. He's not. It's about recognizing who God is. A perfect example. Would you show up to church totally, totally, totally pissed drunk? I hope not. I mean, you'd be, if someone just came in like, hey, man, I'm, oh, let's go to church. Come on, let's get loaded and then go to church. You'd say like, well, wow, that, that, wouldn't, that doesn't make sense. There are certain places, certain things. That would just Some behavior just doesn't make sense. So, okay, so the Pharisees said, well, we want to prepare ourselves to connect with God all of the time. So there are all these laws written in the, in the Torah, in the Bible, about how to live in right, in right standing. So you're, you're, you're welcoming God to your space. So the things that were necessary for the temple or the synagogue, they brought it into their house. And the washing of dishes and the care and eating kosher and this food doesn't touch that food, all of that stuff... They're honoring God by caring for every meal and their house. So the Pharisees, where they're seen as the bad guys, they're actually the good guys. Let me just ask you this. What would life be like if we made a real effort to live in a way where God's presence was welcomed no matter where you were? So what if your home life were treated that way? So the Pharisees are the good guys because they want God's presence to be welcomed at home, at work, in the marketplace, and definitely when you go with other people to worship. Now with that, though, as they looked at those laws, they saw other people weren't living in that way. And a good thing became a bad thing because non-Jews don't live like Jews. And so a Pharisee or a teacher of the law who agreed with them wouldn't invite a, 
a non-Jew into their house. Why? Because they haven't ceremonially washed their hands and they haven't taken care and who knows what they were doing before they got there. I want my house to be a house of God's blessing. How many say, like, I, want, I want my house to be a house of God's blessing? Of course we do. So in order to make their house a place where God would be worshipped, they excluded people who were unlike God. Go a step further. For the non-Jews, that was obvious. But then they found other Jews, other people who believe the Bible and love God. And if they weren't up to standard, if they didn't keep to the rituals, they excluded them as well. So here's the point. A good thing can become a bad thing if we're not careful. And that's what happened to them. A very good thing. The Pharisees are good, but they took it to an unhealthy extreme. Here's why. Who is invited? A couple of questions that we're going to ask to get ourselves thinking about how to grow in the value of Jesus when it comes to eating. Who is invited? Levi or other, other places he's called Matthew. It was common for people to have both a Hebrew, if you're Jewish, a Hebrew and a Greek or a Roman name. So Levi is Matthew. They're the same person. So Matthew Levi or Levi Matthew, he is invited. He's invited to become one of Jesus' closest followers. He's going to end up writing one of the four Gospels. He's going to be one of Jesus' 12 representatives who are going to change the world. And, and this is where we need to remember the whole story. Luke's telling us how Levi is invited in. And we got to remember, Jesus is is not looking for all-stars on his team. He doesn't need the most talented. He doesn't need the most knowledgeable. He doesn't need the most popular. As a matter of fact, most of the people, Paul's kind of an exception because he was a genius. He was brilliant, and God, God used him as well. So if you got brain power, hey, God can use you too. But most of the people that Jesus chooses are very, very regular and often were seen as outsiders. Pharisees, one of those who who kept it right within, everyone else is an outsider, and Jesus seems to break the mold. So Jesus is inviting the very people that the good religious Pharisees are pushing away. Now, why, why was Levi out? Because he's a tax collector, and we've talked about this before. They were seen as, amongst the Jews, as social outcasts. Why? In God's land, Israel, God's people aren't leading it. The Romans are. And so you have Jews who are employed by the Romans in partnership with the Romans collecting taxes. And there was a belief that when Messiah comes, he will bring his kingdom and his kingdom will never end. By the way, God's kingdom included in their mind, it wasn't in the text, in their mind, kicking out of the Romans. So those Jews who were tax collectors were actually fighting with the wrong team. They were on the other political party. They were totally wrong because they were aligning themselves with the very people that God wanted to remove. That was their mindset. On top of it, everybody knew that when you collect taxes, it wasn't like today where there's electronic records and paper trails. You never knew how much made it back to Rome because the tax collector had all the paperwork themselves. So everyone knew they, they hung on to some of the money. So you have Jewish collaborators who are stealing and siding with the wrong team. And where is Levi when Jesus, hear this, when Jesus finds him? In this encounter, what you see is Levi doesn't find Jesus. Jesus finds Levi. Where is he? He's at his tax collector's booth. Don't think IRS and supercomputer and all that. He's, he's probably not one collecting like employment taxes. It's probably a toll tax. As people go from place to place, just like you have some, some roads are toll roads, he's a, it's, think of a toll booth collector. And he's, he's, as people travel along and bring commerce, they're just paying their little bit. Levi is not at the temple. He's not at the synagogue. He's not reading his Bible. He's not praying. He's not doing anything, quote, unquote, Spiritual, he's got a regular job, and that's where Jesus finds him at his job. And he takes him at his job, which was seen by the others as corrupt, and Jesus steps into Levi's space and says, Here's the place where you're invited to a meal because the scene changes. 
he, he meets him at his tax collector's booth and says, come follow me. And Levi, who obviously had heard Jesus before, but probably never thought of himself as qualified, he leaves everything and he goes and has a meal because the next scene is Jesus eating with, with Levi and his friends. This, is, this may not seem like a big deal to you, but it's actually a big deal to God. That there are people in their regular, ordinary world, life, school, neighborhood, work, fun, that Jesus wants to invade with love and purpose and future and change. And what Jesus does is he models the way of God to us. He finds them. Very few instances in the Gospels of people finding Jesus. I mean, there's Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night. There are a few people who are intrigued and they come and find him. Most of the time, Jesus is out there in the community and he is calling people. Think about we're six weeks from today to our event, Good News Today, right over there at Hillsborough Stadium. Why spend the money? Why take the time? Why mobilize? Why pray? Why go there when we can invite everyone to come here? It's really simple. Well, obviously, people can't fit in here. That's, that's an obvious one. But more importantly, it's following the pattern of Jesus. He goes to places where people are. I was driving on 26. We had gone to the coast with some friends and driving back. And I don't know what was going on last night, but I couldn't find a parking spot to be seen at Hillsborough Stadium at the complex. I don't know what was going on, but as we drove going home, I just looked over, because every time I look over, I'm like, Jesus! You know, I'm, I do that. Every time I drive by, I'm like, Jesus, do something. And I was like, ooh, something's going on, because it seemed like every parking spot was filled. It's the place people go. They go for a game. They go for a show. They go for some sports. They, they go there. So our role as Jesus followers is never to wait and expect people just to show up. We go, we move, Jesus finds Levi. Levi doesn't find Jesus. So, so that's who's invited. Well, well, why should we include people? What's the big deal here? Notice what happened in the text. Let's just uh, read it again. Verse verse. 30, the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belong to the sect complain, said, why do you eat and drink with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then he interprets what that means. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Who is the doctor for? So they're complaining, Jesus is eating, which remember the quote, Eating was accepting one. To eat with Levi is to bring him into family-friendly relationship. It's to say, he is with me. This person's under my protection. This person's under my care. And I'm not, when he leaves, I'm not going to turn against him. I've accepted him. It's more than food in their culture. So God is making a huge statement. And then he says, when what doesn't make sense, he goes from food and he talks about a doctor. Because because we get the analogy, Jesus is so wise. Uh, imagine you're, you're feeling sick today, right? You're feeling sick. And, you're not, and then tomorrow you're, like, you're feeling worse. So, so you, you call up your doctor and you say, like, man, these are the symptoms. This is what's going on. Ooh, oh, yeah, okay. And do you have that? Oh, yeah, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're expecting, you know, like you've got your calendar out. When can you see me? He's like, okay, like when you feel better, come in. And I'll just make sure you're feeling better. Because whatever you got, I don't want it. And so don't. Don't come bringing that stuff into my office and don't come to my lobby. And, and, but, but, but I think it'll take four to five days. It'll get worse before it gets better. And, um, and is your current insurance card, is that, is that current? Because I'm billing you for this phone call. And, but I don't want to see you until you're better. I mean, just saying it, it sounds stupid. It sounds ridiculous even saying it because a doctor's very purpose is to bill and charge. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. Um, no, a doctor's purpose, they have studied. This is, this is, those of you in the medical profession, double bless you. Get to the front of the line. Say, Jose said I could be here. Because, <laughs> because those of you in the medical profession, you are going to school and mostly getting into debt to be able to do because it's so expensive to be trained. And then you're spending your day with sick people. You're choosing to go into rooms that personally I want to avoid. That's just, I don't, you know, those who know me 
Wash your hands before you, you know, like, I want, I want, I want clean. And, and those of you in the medical profession choosing to be with those who are unwell, why? Because you know that healing will come. You are willing to put yourself in a place where people are ill to bring healing. And, and so Jesus' analogy should turn the Pharisees' hearts inside out because they're unconcerned with healing for Levi. That's what, it wasn't about the food. It wasn't about that these, these people didn't meet God's standard. It's actually more deep and more painful. God says to them, Pharisees, you're supposed to be the doctors. You've studied, you know, you're trained, you're qualified, you're respected. You're supposed to be the people who bring healing. And instead, you add burden after burden on people, and they go from bad to worse. They go from away from God to further away from God, and they feel guilty because you keep loading them up with all of these rules, and you're not willing to lift one finger to help them. You're pointing the finger at where they get it wrong, but you offer no solution. And guess what? You know the grace of God. You've read the Bible. And you know that God is forgiving and God is receiving and God accepts those who turn back to him. And you're not even willing to let them know of, of people who've messed up in the book and God brought them back. All you want is to look good. And so it's, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, it's the sick. So Jesus says, I didn't come to call the righteous. No, he's not unconcerned about those who are all already living in the right. What Jesus is not saying is who cares how you live. But he's saying that I'm on a very clear mission. There are those who are already in the right. They're okay. All right, they're, they're one with the Father. Fantastic. I'm actually going for those who should be in the right, and I'm going to bring them into the right. And in the cross and in the resurrection, that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus comes not just to be a doctor dispensing little medicines. He becomes the very solution to our deepest wounds. Jesus takes our sin, our disease, our evil, and he takes it on the cross and says, I will be the forgiveness that you need. And so that when you know that you're outside of God's boundaries, you can come to me and my goodness and my grace is enough for you because I'm, I'm risen, because he's alive. He can offer freedom and healing and wholeness to anyone who comes to him. And, and like the doctor, he's there, not just for the healthy. And so if you're here today and you think, well, I don't know if this whole thing is for me. You don't know. And I don't know if I qualify. Yes, you do. If you're breathing, you qualify for the grace of God. Because that you are the person. If you feel like, well, I, I can't because you, you are the very person that Jesus has come for, not to expose and put on display, but to heal and make whole because that's what doctors do. You go in the back room and you have a serious issue. Is a doctor going to parade you into the lobby and say, hey, guys, look at this? No. In that room, they're going to hopefully show you love and care and be with you and guide you. And, and, and medical professionals are so beautifully limited. I mean, they can't heal you. They would be the first to admit it. Only God can heal. But they can be there to show you the way to healing. And, and so Jesus does this. Let's get back to this combination of food and healing. It was so beautiful. I was so proud of my kids. We have a neighbor that's down the road. We don't know at all. And um, we found out that they had lost two of their adult daughters. It's an older couple. Two of their adult daughters in the span of, it was one month, right? It was about one month that they had passed away. Uh, one through a long-term illness, another, I think, through an injury. And it was interesting. Our kids who were kind of getting into food, because dad is and mom is, like, they, they I, th I think, correct, I think it was like their idea. They were making, they were making um, uh, muffins, not muffins, uh, cupcakes. And they said, can we just bring some over to this, this grieving couple who are down the road? I who are probably older than my parents, older than their grandparents. And they just, you know, the, the intuition of 
can we do something, you know? And I wasn't there when they delivered it over, but from what I heard, there was just tears in their eyes. And I do know a, a little bit later, a couple of months later, they just, they, they were by our house. The garage was open and we're just doing some cleaning and they stopped by because our house looks like their house on the inside. It's the same kind of design and, and our kitchen had been remodeled and they were thinking of theirs and they just popped in and said hello and just looking around and, and no big Jesus conversation, but they had never been in and around our place before. But I think like little things like cupcakes, you know, small, can, can open the bridge to people thinking it's okay to be with you. And so food is a bridge for relationship. I just wonder, let's just talk about us because we know Jesus is welcoming. Are we a welcoming people? I just wonder. Are, are we... Not just the Sunday, I hope, I hope you're nice on Sunday, this sounds cliche. I hope that when people come in to, for whatever reason, because they're with, here with a family member or a friend, or just thinking that church may have an answer, if you're mean, or not mean, but if you're just unobservant when people are coming to church, that's not helpful. Can we admit that? It's just not helpful. We ought to be a welcoming people whenever we get together, recognizing that we're going through all sorts of things. Okay, that's just Sunday, though. That's just an hour and a half out of a whole week. Are we a welcoming people in general? Do you have room in your world for others? Is life so busy that the I don't have time becomes the mental excuse to, to push people away? I think what Jesus is trying to say to us Love my neighbor. We looked at love last uh, two weeks ago, and then who my neighbor is last week. That phrase, love my neighbor, we know that it's, it's more than just a meal. It's about welcoming people into your life. And healing can happen around a meal. And so two directions I think I want us to look at, and we want to respond by taking communion. We want to respond in baptism. You see, Levi was included into the into Jesus' team, into his family. And we do know that when anyone turned to Jesus, the first step that they took is like Jesus before he began his work. He was baptized into the water. And so Jesus' disciples from Levi and everyone else, even though they had a pattern of faith, when they chose to follow this Jesus, the first thing they did was go into the water, which we know because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now we know what it means. It is about a leaving of the old and a beginning of the new. I was not following this master, but now that life without Jesus is gone. And now I come up out of the water. Jesus' resurrection means my resurrection. His life means my life. I belong to him. Two things I want us to consider. Jesus is inviting people that we often overlook. And that, that ought to help us reshape everyone that we see. Don't miss that. Your calling is to grow in your following of Jesus. But notice the quick tie. Levi is invited at the tax collector's booth. But what's the first thing that he does is he has a meal with Jesus. And the Bible doesn't say it, but I have to think he had the courtesy to ask Jesus, can I invite some friends? Because remember, meals are about reputations. And if he brings this guy with this scandal into Jesus' presence, then it's going to make Jesus look bad. And if you think Levi had issues, what about his buddies? But somehow, Jesus says, absolutely. And so they're visible enough where the Pharisees and other teachers, so they're not hiding. It's like, okay, you know, just go down this alley, make a left, make a right, like a left, like a right, right? You know, and when it's really dark, go on in this little cave, and I'll meet you there, and we'll have our little Chick-fil-A, because it's Saturday, not Sunday, because on Sunday you can't eat Chick-fil-A. And every time I drive home, <sighs> I shake my fist. <laughs> I want a chicken sandwich on a Sunday. <laughs> I don't shake my fist. I thank God for them. So uh, Jesus is inviting people He's inviting people that we don't even think. Do you know the next generation of people who may lead the church right now may be so far from him? We don't think about it. 
we think, well, you know, if you if you're born in a Christian home and you and you read the Bible, you know, since since you can read and you always go to church, and you're the super good kid. These are the ones that are going to change the world. And I think that's a great value to have a Jesus heritage. I mean, I think that's the ideal for everyone. But right now, the kid in the club or the kid strung out or the kid who doesn't care, they could be the men and women that Jesus is saying are going to reshape the next generation. Jesus is inviting people that sometimes we just overlook. And then the second thing I think we ought to take to heart is that Jesus spends time with people before they follow him. Jesus is spending time. We're going to see it again in the next few weeks when we look at the various texts. Jesus spends time with people before. So somehow Levi had, had a sense of who Jesus was because he wasn't shocked when he comes to his job and says, I think this job is done. I've got something for you. He leaves everything and he follows him. And that ought to do something to you and I when we think about the people that we spend time with. And there's nothing wrong with having all friends who love and follow Jesus. I just think it's unlike Jesus. I just think it's unlike him. I think he makes room. Now, it's not an indictment if over time we've lost, we've lost that. I think we just get so busy and we have limited time for relational bandwidth. So we do a good thing. We do a very good thing. We fill it with people who are going to build us up and strengthen us, and we ought to do that. Please, don't spend all of your time in environments that are unlike Jesus. That's not good. But I have to say, as a friend, if the only thing we're thinking about is time with Jesus' people, we've forgotten Jesus. So let's let this summer be an opportunity to, events are helpful to Move us. So dinner is helpful because it gets people into the presence of Jesus. And I would just say for us, good news today, six weeks from now, is an invitation. It's an opportunity for you and me to take steps of faith. So maybe inviting them into your house is too big of a step or into your world is too big of a step. But look, I mean, Lecrae for free? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and a big party in a big public place with no religious symbols and no baggage. It is going to be a massive party, clear, hear me though, with a clear call to follow Jesus that anyone can listen into and do something with. That's a safe, easy invite. The worst thing that they're going to say is, wow, that was good, thanks. That's the worst that they're going to say. I think this is an opportunity for you and me to think about what it means to be Jesus' followers. Do any of these people follow Jesus as well? I was saying that there was a little hook at the end that, that, that Luke gives us. Do any of the people that are there with Jesus choose to follow him as well at the party? It ends with, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance drops, and he goes on to another story. I think he does this because what Luke is writing is supposed to push us. What you don't know, you know when Jesus encounters Levi, Levi becomes a disciple. What you don't know is when Jesus speaks to these friends, you don't know if they became one of the close followers as well. We just, we, did they become one of the 70? They didn't become one of the 12. But did they become one of the 70? We don't know. Were they there on the day of Pentecost, 120, when the Spirit is poured out? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And what we don't know should cause us to live differently. Because right now there are people in your sphere of influence who, who are loved by God, who Jesus came to rescue. He's already pursuing them. He's going after them. And he's wondering, will you, Jose, partner with me, Jesus? Will you partner with me so they will know how much I care? So can you care for them? Will you sacrifice for them? Will you hang out with them? Will you listen to them? And when you hear stuff that's so unlike me, will you not point the finger but will you listen and be with them and wait for the open door and just say, hey, do you know, have you ever thought about and offered an alternative? Would you have dinner with them? Would you invite them in? Would you include them in things that you only include your close friends for? Jesus is simply saying, will you live like me? Now, here's the good news. You were made for this. This isn't like 
I can't do that. Yes, you can. You were made for it. It's what Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit to do. So here's what I'm going to do. I don't want to leave you with like, Jose, why do you always tell me to do stuff? And then like, then feed me to make me feel better. Why do you, why do, you do that? Because I'm like Jesus. Um, I'm going to look at five things and then, that anyone can do. And then one thing I'm asking some of you to do. Five and one. Here we go. Quick. Have lunch with someone new today after the gathering. You can do that. Today, we're about to eat. You can find someone you don't know super well, and you can just say, hey, tell me a little bit about your story. You never know what God could do today as we go out there and eat. This week, you could set aside one meal, just one meal, and include someone you don't normally invite. One meal in the entire week. Give some margin. Ask God today, God, which is the best meal and who's the best person? You could take a walk in the neighborhood and stop and say hello to people. Just stop and say hello. Well, well, they didn't didn't introduce themselves to me. Take the initiative. Start a conversation. You never know. You could throw a party with some friends this summer. And then how about you have three friends who maybe follow Jesus. Hey, everyone, let's just invite anybody. And all of our friends get to know each other, whether they follow Jesus or not. Just one, one little party in the whole summer. Uh, you can think of one thing you enjoy and include someone. You like to fish? Take someone you normally wouldn't take. Like the golf? Take someone you wouldn't normally take. You, you like to do whatever? Take, take, take someone in that you don't normally because you're going to have fun doing it. And who knows what could happen? That's five things any one of us can do this summer to be a little bit more like Jesus. Now, one thing I'm asking some of you to do, and we'll put up a slide. It's called the Outpost. Here in Hillsborough, there's a partnership between churches and our city to feed people. I don't know if you knew that. Sunrise Church, just down the road, leads the way. And partnering with the city of Hillsborough, the city provides food for kids and families at Shoot Park every, five days a week lunch. And all they ask, and, and, and Sunrise is leading it. We're just joining in. They invite churches to adopt a week, just one week. And so all we're asked to do is provide the volunteers. So basically, 1145 to 1245 from, on July 9th through the 13th, a little bit of setup. The food is already there at Shoot Park. A little bit of setup, hand it out, and a little bit of cleanup done in one hour, and that is a way to be like Jesus, to hand out food to some people who are at the park. Now, are you asked to talk with anyone? No. Just hand out food. Smile. But you know what? If you hang out at the park afterwards, you never know. You may bump into someone you already know. Who knows what God can do? Here's what I need you to do for this. I need you to do it N-O-W. Now, I need you to go to our website because we need 10 people each day. Just 10. You can pick one day. You go to our website. You scroll to the bottom. Look at that thing, the outpost. When you sign up, you could pick the day and the number of people, and then we know when all 10 are filled that day. I need you to schedule that. Don't just like, oh, I'll show up at Shoot Park. No, 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 no. Sign up so we know we have the 10 people. We committed to it. And now I'm asking we to be we, (laughs) like us. Shoot park, one hour. These are baby steps. This is like, this is like no-brainer stuff. The harder part is to invite people in your world long-term with real non-Jesus issues. And and that requires grace, but we can start somewhere. All right. Uh, We're going to ask God to use us. And I'm going to invite you, even if you would stand now and Let's stand together. We're going to worship. Uh, In a few minutes, when Ryan and Hannah open the table, uh, there are a few people who have prepared to be baptized into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to celebrate their baptism. And if you're here this morning and you say, Jose, I've, I've started following Jesus, but I've never been baptized, I'm going to encourage you, take that step. And when when we invite everyone to go to tables, all you need to do is go over to the baptism, talk with one of our elders, and we'd love to. We've got towels, we've got everything. We'd love to, for you to step into obedience and be baptized this morning. 
You say, Jose, I'm, I'm not even following. I'm like the, I'm like the Levi guy. Like I'm, I'm, I just showed up because someone said come and I, I want to follow Jesus. Here's all I want you to do is when everyone moves out and goes to one of these tables, just go over towards the water tank over here. Even if you're not ready to be baptized yet, that's totally cool. And just say to someone standing over there, hey, I want to follow this Jesus. I'm gonna, I want to take that first step and we would love to pray with you. Lord, thank you that you call us to be uh, inviters. You call us to welcome people to food, to drink, to relationship, to conversation. And Jesus, we're just asking you as we respond in worship, as we move our hearts towards the table and we think about your great sacrifice, your death and resurrection, your body and your blood, your love poured out towards us. Help us, Holy Spirit of God, to walk in the same love as Jesus and to take the same steps and sacrifice as Jesus for the good of people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond in worship.